pretty historical event. It's the first Asian American Pacific, I mean, a Asian Pacific American Heritage Month here on campus. So it's supposed to be celebrated in May, but we're doing it in April because of final week. So I'm glad that everybody showed up. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a few facts about um, the Asian American community. Uh, you might not know this, but some of the founders of uh, these companies are Asian. Uh, YouTube, some of the, uh, everybody goes on YouTube and watch videos, and especially for classes. Uh, Zappos, LegalZoom, so some of, the, some of these companies, and also future companies. So um, I'm glad that everybody's here, and uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Tammy King. She's from Bridgewater State University, uh, which was the home for Upward Bound for many years. For 17 years, we stayed at Bridgewater State College, which used to be a college back then. Uh, when I was a student, when some of my coworkers were students in Upward Bound, so uh, she's a green chemistry professor at Bridgewater State University, and uh, she's going to talk about her journey through higher ed and also uh, her community service activities. So, Dr. Tammy King. Thank you, Raxme. Good morning, everybody, uh, and thanks for coming here. Uh, it is such an honor to be here today, be the first speaker for the Asian Pacific Heritage Month event. Just raise your hand if you think, I, I could project my voice. Um, I'm trying to control it right now, but if you can't hear me, just raise your hand and I'll project it like I'm teaching in the classroom. Um, all right, so I'm a PhD chemist. Um, part of my research involves green chemistry, greening the chemistry curriculum for middle school and high school. Um, but if I go back many, many years ago when I was your age, would I have thought that I will be a PhD chemist or even a, a, a higher ed professor, a college professor? And the answer is no. Uh, I didn't even know what to do back then. So I'd like to share with you my, my like racks me, Raxme said, my journey through college, through graduate school, and how I decided to, um, to be a, a teaching faculty, a faculty member at Bridgewater State University. Oh, that's right. Um, Thank you. So maybe I could get off the podium. As you can tell, I'm not used to the microphone. <laughs> All right, so um, to go back to where I came from, um, hopefully that's working. Or... Uh, you the arrow. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Um, you actually have to take a Boeing 747 to first cross the continental US. There is no direct flight from Boston to the Philippines right now. If you've heard in the news, uh, I think there is a new Boeing, uh, which has a direct flight from Boston to Japan in 13 hours. If I go home, it takes me 24 hours to get to the Philippines. But you have to cross the big Pacific Ocean. There's usually a stop over in Japan or Hong Kong. Um, and then before going to the Philippines. So the Philippines consists of more than 7,000 islands. Um, I can't remember how many are inhabited, but Excuse we, um, on, I came from the major island of Luzon, and it's about 70 miles, the province that I grew up, and it's about 70 miles from south of Manila, which is the capital city. I'm just trying to uh, find, I'm sorry, last minute, my pointer, but uh, I'll just forgo that pointer. Our neighbors include, and I think I have a closer map. So um, you can see that it's, we're in Southeast Asia. Um, you cannot see Japan, North, 
east of the Philippines. Um, but you notice Indonesia is to our south, to, to our east are Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and immediately to our north is Hong Kong. And I included a flag of the Philippines the three stars represent the three major islands of Luzon. The middle part are, is called the Visayan region, and the southern part is called Mindanao. So my full name is Shalito de Ramos. Could anyone tell me what language that came from? From this? Spain. 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 We were under the Spanish rule for about 300 years, over 300 years. That's why, you know, if you see an Asian, the first name is like Hispanic. Most likely that person is from the Philippines. So we were under the Spanish rule for over 300 years. It started with Magellan's journey to the Pacific. Um, and unfortunately, Magellan was killed shortly after his arrival by a tribal leader, Filipino tribe tribal leader. Uh, however, in uh, 1565, we became, uh, we were conquered by Spain, just like Mexico was maybe a little, a few years earlier. Um, and that's the reason why most Filipinos are Roman Catholic. They converted us to Christianity, primarily as Roman Catholic. They built one university in a number of uh, small public schools, elementary school, high school system, but there is only one university. There, there wasn't much effort to educate the Filipinos. Um, uh, it did not happen until the, the US um, took over in 1898. So as you know from history, oppression uh, leads to revolt and it started, the final revolt against Spain started in 1896 and ended in 1898 during the Spanish-American War where uh, together with Cuba, Puerto Rico, in the Philippines, we were bought from Spain for $20 million by the United States. So from 1935 to 1946, we were actually a US Commonwealth. Um, there were three, I remember there were three Filipino presidents of the Commonwealth. And we gained independence from the US shortly after World War II. So I just want to explain, how many of you watch The Simpsons or used to watch The Simpsons? Okay, at least about close to half my audience. Um, Lisa Simpson is like a misfit in the Simpson family because she's highly intelligent and of course she thinks differently from uh, the members of the family. While I do not consider myself a misfit in my family, when I was growing up, I thought I was so different from all my classmates. And probably because I was such a perfectionist, I probably have more amb ambitions than most of them. Um, so I thought I was odd compared to most of my classmates. Um, part of my title is Lisa Simpson because I could relate to her being kind of a misfit among my classmates. And uh, 2,000 pairs of shoes. From 1965 to 1986, pretty much from, um, uh, well, I was born in 1966. So the year before I was born to the year before I graduated from college, there is only one government in the Philippines, and it was ruled by former dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Now, you could probably tell from the picture, um, his wife stands out, uh, our first la former first lady, Imelda Marcos. She was known for extravagance. And uh, when they were finally kicked out of power by a relatively peaceful people revolution. We call it the people power. In 1986, and people started storming Malacanang Palace, which is the equivalent of White House. Here, um, they found almost 2,000 pairs of shoes that Imelda Marcus left behind. Uh, I do have, uh, I love shoes also, but I, 
I, I don't even have 20, maybe I'm close to 20 pairs. Uh, it's a different story if you ask my husband. But uh, that's, that's now in a museum, whatever they saved from a recent flood that uh, ruined part of Malacanang. But um, there's still about close to 2,000 pairs. And uh, the last part of my title, I used the word spectrophotometer, who I've become, I'm a chemist, like I introduced myself earlier, and one of the common equipment or instrument that chemists use for chemical analysis is a spectrophotometer. It could be very fancy, like uh, a gas chromatograph, a, a GC mass spec, if you watch NCIS. Did I say that right? NCIS, right? Abby, which is the chemist in NCIS, she always brags about her GC mass spec. Um, and it separates compounds and identifies them. So, all right, so I'd like to share, uh, take you back to where I grew up. The Philippines is primary, primarily agricultural. And actually, I took this picture the last time I was home in 2007. I passed this, there's a bridge. I passed this every day when I was in high school because I went to a different town in high school. Um, and between towns, there are like huge rice fields, left and right of the road. Um, so because, like I said, we're primarily agricultural. Mode of transportation, there's a lot of public transportation available. And um, especially in very narrow streets, we use what is called a tricycle. It's basically a small motorcycle with a sidecar. And it could fit um, the one that's facing you. Two, three inside, there's an additional chair. And then you can, uh, a passenger could also ride behind the driver. Um, in the motorcycle. But uh, that's very common where I grew up. If we want to go from one town to another, we usually take the tricycle. Let's see. And this is also co common view in the Philippines. There is no zoning law. And so you can find uh, poor families living in the background beyond that coconut tree in the middle. That's more of a middle class house with concrete walls and tin roof. And it's a tropical weather, and so we don't need a dryer. A lot of people still wash their clothes by hand. All right, so my dad's side of the family, they had, they owned uh, big parcels of land, so they're, they're middle class family. My mother's side of the family, however, is an inspiring story of um, how a close-knit family rose from poverty to upper middle class because my grandmother believed in education. During World War II, my grandpa was killed, maternal grandfather was killed by the Japanese soldiers. And back then, women stay home with their children, they raise their children. So my grandma is sudden, suddenly widowed at, I calculated she's just in her middle 30s during that time with seven kids, seven kids. The youngest uh, was three months old, the eldest was 15 years old. And um, my grandmother believed in education and um, so she worked like a maid. She washed people's clothes. She washed clothes for the rich family. She cooked food for them. Um, like I said, she worked like a maid. And she um, sent the first child to college. I believe my aunt had a scholarship because they could not have afforded with her salary raising seven kids during that time to send one kid to college. So I believe my aunt had a scholarship. I know for sure my mother had a full scholarship. So my aunt became an elementary school teacher. Now this is a tradition in the Philippines. If you're the eldest kid, your parents paid for your education, which is not very expensive. And back then there are scholarships. Your parents paid for your education, you are expected to pay for your 
next for your brothers or sisters education the, the next one in age and so she helped she got married right away though so she didn't help much but the second one in the family uh, he was on full scholarship she, he attended uh, engineering school. He became a mechanical engineer. Now, when he had a family, um, he immigrated to the United States. He's now in San Francisco. But our education system is not recognized by the US as equivalent. And so to, to raise his family, he worked as a clerk, and he retired as a clerk. The third one didn't finish college, but he started business. He um, started his own business. And then the fourth one also majored in business and finished college. I only had one uncle. One of the seven kids did not finish college. Everyone else finished. So those next two are business. Um, my aunt became an elementary school teacher as well. Those two educated the youngest because my mother, which is next, she had a full scholarship. She attended an engineering school um, and majored in chemistry with a minor in mathematics. And the youngest is, oops, I missed that. The youngest uh, became a nurse. Uh, like I said, the two other siblings paid for her education. They all pitch in. They all pitch in. So my, my aunt is now living in Chicago. She's a retired nurse. All right, so our education system. There are 10 years of compulsory education, six years of elementary school, and four years of high school. So 10 years. Don't be envious because we're in school pretty much all day from 7 o'clock to 3.30, 4 o'clock. And let's see. Science and math classes are taught in English. We learn English in second grade. Uh, maybe in first grade, but I barely remember. Second grade, we were constructing sentences. Subject, predicate, and so on. I remember those parts. Uh, we are highly literate, about 85% literacy rate. And it's pretty much the same for male and female. So I was not even six years old. I was five when I entered first grade. My mom tried to put me in kindergarten when I was four in the town where she was teaching. And it's, you know, I don't know anybody. And I drop out. My mom gave up. I mean, he, she tried for two weeks, but I just wouldn't participate. So back in our town, a year later, I entered first grade. I know some kids because that's where I grew up. And I remember the first day when my mom was being interviewed by my first grade teacher. I don't know if you recognize the abacus. I couldn't find the picture of what I actually use, but it's more like this one. So my mom was talking to my teacher, and I started playing with the abacus, and I said, 99, 100, and they both cheered. Um, so I guess I impressed my first grade teacher back then, and there were 36 kids in our first grade class. Uh, not counting, there are two little ones. Those are my teacher's um, son and daughter. Okay. Hope I'm not forgetting anything here. So I attended college after six years of elementary school. I was um, 11 years old when I started first year high school. High school in another town, back to where I dropped out from kindergarten. Again, that's because that's where my mom was working as a chemistry teacher during that time. And let's see, so I was, Four years of high school, I was 15 years old when I finished high school. And um, it's not smooth sailing for me. I'm back in my town, there are only 36 kids, right? When I finished sixth grade, I was the first in class. Now I went to this bigger high school, there are 150 of us freshmen. And I'm not used to being not number one. Suddenly I dropped down to seven place and you know I was not happy but the problem is like most of you probably went through I tried so hard to fit in remember it's not my town 
And those, my classmates, they already have friends. It took me two years to have what I could call a best friend. So I, um, I, I was quiet. I was quiet in high school. I kept to myself. And I remember a conversation when I was trying so hard to fit in. Uh, our, by the way, my classmates are all girls. They separated girls from boys. So I started to a smaller group of, of girls, and I was trying hard to fit in. And um, you know, they're they're funny. They have stories. So I started making a story. Um, it's not made up, really. I was telling a story, and then one of them said, "You know, I know you're trying hard, but you're really boring." And so I retreated. I. I kept to myself again, and I was like, you know, I can't win. I'll just focus on my studies. So I rose from seventh place to second place. The only person I couldn't beat was our valedictorian. Um, and there's only one class that I actually got a higher grade from her. It's our language, Filipino. I guess I was better in composition. and. Anyway, um, so 1982 is when I graduated from high school. I thought I'll show you some timeline here. Remember the Marcus uh, dictatorship that started in 1965? I was born a year later. Started first grade when Marcus declared martial law. So he even had more power when he declared martial law. I remember having a curfew in our town and we can't be outside the street at a certain time. But it's dark at 6 o'clock anyway, so I guess for the most part, it didn't bother us. Most of the um, happened in Manila, near the capital city. It was relatively peaceful in our town, about uh, 70 miles south of Manila. And I thought I'll... I'll uh, put in some technology there. 1970s, the black and white TV was just introduced in our province of Laguna. And I don't know if you guys remember the boom box when you can use a cassette tape. That was in the 1980s when I was in high school. And let's see, I graduated from high school 1982. Um, and I was in college in 1986 trying to finish up when Marcos was kicked out of power by people's revolution. It's a peaceful revolution. All right, so from high school, I graduated second. Um, that's what we call salutatorian, right? In a class of 150 students. And I was lucky to pass the entrance exam to this prestigious university. It's a beautiful place. The campus is beautiful. It's about 60 miles from where I grew up. And uh, only our valedictorian and myself passed the competitive entrance exam. Um, can't remember how many students were back there. It's called the University of the Philippines. Uh, the campus is called Los Baños. There's another campus in Manila and uh, south of the Philippines in Mindanao. OK, so let's see. I, this is the science, physical science building. So I was a chemistry major, our valedictorian. We stayed in the same dorm. Um, and this is the physical science building. It's not much different when I was there. And the biological sciences building is separate. This is this building housed the physics department, computer science, and mathematics, and what am I missing? Physics, mathematics, computer science, and chemistry. Um, on the top right, that library building was new during my time, and I didn't have much time for books. I forgot to mention, when I entered college, my sister, the eldest in the family, is a junior engineering student in Manila. She initially had a full scholarship, but the company went bankrupt when she was a sophomore. So suddenly, there's this big expenses for my parents. My dad is a carpenter. My mom is a high school teacher who's not earning much. So it was tight. Money was very, very tight. So I didn't have money for books. And I frequented that library. It's uphill, by the way. I was so. Well, you might think I'm skinny, but I was 20 pounds lighter back then. Um, 
Another building that I included in the picture, it's called Baker Hall. Baker is an American name. During World War II, but this is where we had our phys ed classes, by the way, Baker Hall. And it's too far from the other buildings. We have to use transportation if you don't feel like walking when it's 90 degrees out with humidity factored in. Um, we use that jeepney as public transportation inside the campus. But Baker Hall served as an intern Japanese internment camp in World War II. There were 2,500 Filipino and American soldiers in that incarcerated at Baker Hall uh, during World War II. I can't find how many of them actually survived the two-year uh, imprisonment at Baker Hall. So just like you, I had challenges in college. Like I said, money was tight because there are two of us in college. My grandparents, paternal grandparents, were uh, helping with my sister's education. But uh, my, my parents was paying for mine. Um, I also, coming from public school, I find myself um, not competing very well with more prepared college students from Philippine Science High School. They even had a thesis in high school. Um, and UP Rural High School, I'm going to come back to that. University of the Philippines, it's a college prep high school within the University of the Philippines system. I will mention that one more time later. But they were very much prepared for college. And I, my grades during my first year were horrible. I was also getting homesick. So you might think I'm only 60 miles from where I grew up. But we're all full-time students. There is no job for high school graduates, col some college graduates don't, don't even have a job. So if you're a college student, you're full-time. Your parents usually paid for you to go to college. And the UP system, in particular, University of the Philippines system, they instituted, uh, I think it's called standardized tuition and fees. Uh, the amount of money we pay for tuition and fees depends on our parents' income. So I was on the second tier because my mom was a high school teacher. Um, my dad's a carpenter, so we were, we're not really like poor, poor, but uh, I paid, we paid $150 per semester. So back then, my allowance was $10 a week, and that's enough for food and transportation. Let's see. So I was very homesick. There was no internet. There was no cell phone. My parents didn't even have a, a phone at home. They don't even have a landline. Um, and so, you know, I only get to see them on weekends. I go home on weekends. So I was so homesick. Um, my professors are tough, especially those chemistry professors. They were educated here in the U.S., then went back to the Philippines and, um, you know, worked in industries or started teaching in the University of the Philippines system. So they're like, some of them really, it felt like they believe they're gods, you know? There are no office hours. You can't raise your hand during class and ask a question. That's a big no-no back then. Um, and so my grades were really bad on getting Cs. I didn't get a D, but most of my grades were in the C range during my first year. And um, I know it's shape up or ship out. And worse, my mom and dad said, you know, I'm struggling, no boyfriend. Um, so I tried to listen. I did, I did listen. Too bad for that boy. <laughs> There's just this, this kid, he was very artistic and he drew a portrait of me and I was falling in love and my mom and dad said no boyfriend, so I said, okay. Um, I got sick during my second semester as a freshman. A lot of it is because of the stress. And um, so my, my, I think it was what we call now clinical depression. So my parents brought me home to recuperate. So that's the second semester of my first year. And you know, I, I started getting better, but I still have, I was like, do I want to continue? My grades are falling apart. And it's just so tough. It's just so tough. I'm not used to that. 
I'm used to being second place in high school. Um, suddenly, I'm, I'm struggling to pass my courses. And so when I was feeling better, I was folding the laundry, and I noticed the holes in my parents' underwear. And I was good in sewing. I mean, in high school, we learned to sew. We learned to cook during home economics. So I started sewing them. When my parents came home, I was like, why don't you just buy new underwear? I've sewn this before. I'm sewing it again. And my mom said, oh, it's OK. It's an undergarment. And then it hit me. They don't have extra money for that. And so I said, what am I doing here? I just need to toughen up. They're sacrificing. My dad is working in rooftops on a 90 degree weather as a carpenter. My mom was working, uh, grading a lot of papers, just getting headaches from grading papers. And I have to toughen up. So it's like an awakening for me. And so I said, OK, better shape up. Went back to the college, uh, university. And I started looking for help. My lab instructors helped. Remember, no office hours from my professors. I also started making friends at the dormitories, so we had study groups, and that helped a lot. And then um, during the second semester of my sophomore year, I finally made it to Dean's List. So I was so happy. And then also during the second semester of my sophomore year, I joined the Chemical Society, or we can simply call it the Chemistry Club. That's our emblem. It was founded before I was born. And so I got involved. Um, and we had so much club activities. We have sports meet on Saturdays when I'm supposed to be home relaxing, right? We have quizzes. Uh, we call those academic competitions. There's a math quiz we participated in. There's a physics quiz, animal science quiz, name it. We joined everything. So I got so busy, and I, my grades started slipping. Um, and also, um, as I became vice president of the chemistry club, and one of my major duties as vice president is to run our free tutorial services for the general chemistry class. So I was getting so busy, my, my grades were slipping, and I decided I got to manage my time more. And I did. I just have to cut down on club activities. So I find the right balance. And I just want to mention, this is taken um, during our end of the semester gathering. That's our chemistry club back then. I, I just want to mention. About 40%, I started counting when I saw that picture, about 40% of students in that picture attended graduate school in the United States. So I finally made it to the finish line. I was not cum laude. My GPA was barely a 3.0, OK? And that's because of my so much struggles during my first year. So about a month or two after I graduated from college, and by the way, we were required to complete a thesis in college as chemistry majors. So I finished mine in a year and a half. It, took, it delayed my graduation. So instead of finishing up in four years, I finished in five years. Um, I had to change project because I was not getting any yield. It's a synthetic organic chemistry project, so I have to produce a compound out of coconut uh, oil starting material. And it was not working at first, so it kind of delayed my graduation. But I finished um, in my fifth year. And I landed a first job as a science instructor. Remember that UP Rural High School? Those students were so prepared, so ready for college. I was hired to teach chemistry and uh, general science, one section of general science. So general science is the first year science. Sophomore year is biology. Third year in high school is chemistry. And fourth year, we have to take physics. There are four years of mandatory science education in high school. So I taught there from 1987 to 1990. That's my first year class of general science. 
And I was counting, I was like, oh my gosh, those kids are going to be closer to their 40s pretty soon. And some of them became um, doctors. Uh, I only know one who came here for graduate school as a uh, also chemistry, PhD chemist student. And uh, I was able to communicate with her maybe three, four years ago. And I said, what made you decide to major in chemistry? And she said, it was you. It was your teaching. So I was so proud. But anyway, um, let's, let me back off a little bit. So during my second, I taught high school for three years. Um, during my second year of teaching high school, I took the professional exam for chemists. In the Philippines back then, you cannot practice as a chemist without pa passing the board exam, just like our lawyers here. So I, as a full-time instructor, I studied on weekends, and fortunately, I passed the professional exam for chemists. Um, so technically, I could work in industry. But I fell in love with my teaching job, so I decided to stay teaching high school. And you know, my, my, course was, my course load was heavy. I barely have enough time for myself. But I love teaching, so I stayed teaching for um, three years in that high school. During my third year of teaching, oh, so sophomore year also when I was taking the board exam, one of my close friends from college left for North Carolina. He was admitted to a PhD program at the University of North Carolina, PhD in chemistry. So he said, he was encouraging me. I said, take the GRE. And I said, GRE what? And he said, he explained to me, it's a graduate record exam. It's a prerequisite for graduate school. And you have to get a certain score in order to be admitted to graduate school. So I studied on weekends again because I still have a full-time job, and took the GRE. And the other reason is many of my friends from the Chemical Society, they already left the Philippines and, st and were studying here. So it's like I went with the flow. I had no clue what I'm going to do with a PhD in chemistry, but they're doing it, so I said I'm going to do it too. Um, and also, I was thinking, if I stay teaching high school, I can't even afford to buy a car. I didn't have a driver's license back then. There are so many public transportation in the Philippines, so I didn't need to drive a car. But it's, you know, I don't earn much. It's just enough for a single person. Um, it's, so I decided to try um, and applied. I applied to three institutions and got an acceptance from the University of Cincinnati. Um, I already did that. And so, um, I took the big Boeing again, well, for the first time, really. The first one is just to bring you back to where I came from, but from the Philippines to Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. That was a long trip. I threw up on the plane. I was so homesick. I was so sick my first time to be in a plane, and it's in a Boeing 747. Um, but anyway, I made it to Cincinnati alive, and let's see. By the way, graduate school in chemistry, you're probably thinking, how is she going to afford that? I don't have to. I got a stipend. It's common. If you study chemistry, um, I don't know about, I, I know for most of the sciences, you get a stipend. In return, you have to work as a teaching assistant. So in big universities, I don't know if some of you tried starting to study in a big university, you're in this big lecture hall, and then you get split into lab sections, and uh, your instructor is a teaching assistant, a graduate student, not a professor. So I work as a teaching assistant. Some of the pictures that I took, um, so the picture on the left is still old. I couldn't find my building the, uh, where chemistry was, and it turned out it was, uh, uh, it was uh, brought down, and there's a new construction there on the right. So that used to house the chemistry building. Um, not chemistry building. Chemistry is probably on several floors in that Crossley Tower. So it's a big university. 
And there were more than 20 of us graduate students, about 50 to 60% are international students. So um, I found a true another Filipino who was a, a year ahead of me, also in the chemistry program at the University of Cincinnati. Um, she was able to find housing for me, so I lived on campus. But you could just imagine the culture shock that I first felt coming directly from the Philippines. Okay, let's see, I was 23 years old when I came to the U.S. So I was so homesick. My parents still didn't have a landline during that time. So I, I had to make arrangement to call them through our neighbors. Um, they have a telephone, and back then, you know, there was only AT&T and MCI in campus housings. I had to pay $2.50 a minute back in 1990 for a minute of phone call. So my, my, our conversations were short. It's like five minutes. I get to talk to everybody in my family. They had to line up and, you know, just a simple hello. Um, so I was so homesick, first time being away from my country. Internet was just starting in the 1990s. Can you imagine not having cell phones, not having emails? So it's just starting back then. I really want to go home. So remember I tried to quit when I, I quit uh, kindergarten, right? I tried to quit high school. And then grad school, here we go again. I wanted to give up. Okay. So I, uh, there's another hospital trip. Went to the ER, my, my fever wouldn't go down. And again, thinking back, I think that's a sign of clinical depression. It was just not diagnosed back then as clinical depression. Um, and so I started thinking, I said, I really want to go home. I can't stand this anymore. And so, you know, I started thinking, what if I go back? It's such a shame. My parents gave me their life savings so I could afford the one-way ticket to the U.S. from the Philippines. And, and uh, here am I again, thinking of going back. What am I going to do? Go back to teaching high school. I can't even afford a car with that salary. Never mind starting a family, right? And so, oh, uh, that will be later. One of the challenges also. But that will be for later. Um, so fortunately, um, there was a small group of Filipino community. And they started you know, encouraging me. It's really not my grades that's a problem. I'm just so homesick. I was so prepared for grad school. That's one thing that I found out, that my college prepared me so well for grad school. But I'm just so homesick that I want to go home. Um, so there's a small support group from the Filipino community, and that's how I survived. Um, so I focus on studying again, and, and uh, my grades were always A's and B's. I'm not a straight A student, okay, but they're good. I started doing research. Um, one of the challenges that I had, so I started doing research. There are three or four other graduate students in the lab. And, um, and then because I couldn't reach the top of the shelf, they have footstools for me all over the lab. So it's kind of like intimidating, but after a while I said, you know, this is something I cannot change, so I might as well live with it. So every time I need to reach something, I will carry that footstool so that you know, I could reach the chemical on top of the shelf. It's not, not really a big deal, I'm so used to it now. Um, so I started more pressure, by the way, because in grad school we have to publish. And we're doing the work. We're the one doing the work in the lab. Our research advisor, they're the ones writing the grant. We have to do the work. We have to write papers so uh, we can publish. So I was able to do that. She was very, very helpful. Um, and I think the reason why she understood um, my homesickness is because she did her postdoc in Switzerland, so she's, uh, native, she's from the U.S., but she had to go to Switzerland for her postdoctoral uh, program, and so she understood being away from home. Um, okay. And of course, um, 
I was finishing up in 1994, 1995 is when I graduated, but jobs were scarce back then. The economy was bad back then, kind of like right now. It's hard to find a job. So those are other challenges that I felt, uh, that I faced. And I haven't mentioned, but in 1993, I decided to have a family. I got married in 92. Um, a year later, my son was born in graduate school, okay? And we're living on our stip my stipend, okay? But he was born and I decided to think differently. Now my priorities change. I have to raise him, right? And I wanna give him the best, just like any parent would think of their children. And so who could, you know, not try to give the best for that cute little boy? Not then he's cute. Um, and I mentioned my support group, the reason why I was able to pull through and get through graduate school. And aside from um, my advisor, my thesis advisor, she was really very, very helpful. Okay, so I finished grad school. I got my PhD degree in December of 95. Um, my son is growing up and I need to find a job but there's no full-time job for analytical chemist. My field was analytical chemist back then. There's no job for us. Um, organic chemists, they get jobs everywhere because everybody's looking for synthetic chemists. They produce something, especially in pharmaceuticals for manufacture of drugs. They get a job as soon as they finish graduating. High-paying industrial job. By the way, I was so envious. Um, and so I started teaching part-time. This is where I relate to you. I taught for a year and a half part-time at Cincinnati State Technical Community College. Um, they have a chemistry program, um, associate's degree in chemistry, and I taught in the chemistry department. Um, and I actually find, found it a very rewarding job because as a TA, we had so many pre-med students, and they're like spoiled brats. They just want an A, okay? They just want an A. They made a mistake in the test, they come to you. They want you to regrade their test. Two points? Come on, arguing with me for two points, right? Here, it's so different. They're working full-time, they attend school part-time, and they're so appreciative of what I was doing. And I work hard, I always work hard. And so, um, you know, I really like my part-time teaching job in that community college. However, it's not full-time and I really need to find a full-time job. Uh, my son was on Medicare back then because we didn't have enough money. And so um, I kept on applying, looking for a full-time job and um, I, I must have applied to 20 different schools um, I got some interviews for a teaching position, one industrial position, but I got to move forward. I decided to accept a teaching position at Bridgewater State College, so from Ohio to Massachusetts. Big difference in cost of living, but it's a full-time job, and it's a tenure-track position, so there is that in the future, hopefully, job security. Um, my marriage was falling apart, so I would have to relocate as a single parent. I gotta find daycare for my child, um, housing, of course, and let's see, higher cost of living. I didn't know anybody back then, except for the people who interviewed me. Um, and, you know, my son was three years old back then. Um, and then, but then again, I look at the benefits. If I get tenured, I have that job security, and it's a, teaching is what I like to do, and so there are benefits like healthcare, and so I decided to teach at BSU, and I stayed. This is now my, I finished my 15th year of teaching there. So um, I need to fast forward again, but I started in 1997 as an assistant professor, uh, two years later, I remarried to this wonderful guy, Robert King III. So that's why my last name now is De Ramos King. Uh, 
Okay, we went home right after we got married. We went back to the Philippines, and everybody was texting. Even in the public transportation, everybody was texting. We went home. We didn't even have a cell phone. All right, but we had a good time. So, um, and also remember, in 2000, that's the real millennium. Okay. Um, my son had a good time. Is um, the one with his leg raised up on the picture on the right. Um, my husband and I also had a good time. And tell you what, if I stayed in the Philippines, I would not be able to afford this vacation. I, you know, there are places in the Philippines, especially near the beach, near the ocean, that I would not have been to. All right, so vacation ended, back to work. Um, a little bit about the chemistry department. We now hit 100 chemistry majors in the department. When I started, there are only 40 majors. Um, we have programs, the chemistry program is accredited by the American Chemical Society. So if you guys are majoring in the sciences, don't hesitate to come to us. We are number one in 2009 in terms of number of graduates, chemistry graduates that are certified by the American Chemical Society. Uh, if you notice, MIT and Northeastern were the two universities ahead of us, but they're private, right? So, all right. Um, and again, there are a lot of things that are cool when it comes to the chemistry department at Bridgewater State University. We have cool geeks. These are my colleagues. Uh, we are, t let's see, 36% Asian American faculty. It's because one of them is like half Asian. So, um, okay, so uh, just some timeline, but I know I have to finish up soon. We went back to the Philippines in 2007. Remember those three kids in the picture on top? So when we went back, my son is 13 years old, the one who's uh, enjoying some quality time with his grandfather. Um, and those are the kids who were in the picture in 2007. They're all grown up, uh, or growing up, and there are more grandkids or nieces and nephews for me. I got tenured in uh, 2002, so that's job security. It comes with promotion to associate professor, and uh, like I said, we visited the Philippines again in 2007. Another challenge, I lost my mom to cancer in 2008. That's why I went home in 2007. She was recuperating. Um, so in 2008, the cancer came back, and we lost her to cancer. Um, she was my role model. Uh, pretty much taught me everything. She was my first teacher. That's why I could count up to 100 when I was five years old. Uh, I you know, became chairperson in the chemistry department in 2009 and I got promoted to professor in 2010. And I just want to share with you before I close, um, this is the, in the new science building when it opened, and that's how it looks. So please come visit our beautiful campus. Uh, yours is also beautiful, by the way, but we have a new science and math building. Um, and this is how our labs look like, minus the chairs. Um, I did a lot of, as a chemist, I don't only teach our analytical chemistry courses, our instrumental methods. Um, I let my students learn to use the instruments. I'm, I also got involved in a number of outreach programs and community projects. In particular, the one that's closest to my heart is testing of arsenic in soil. Arsenic comes from pressure-treated lumber. Their manufacture was banned in 2000. Gosh, I can't remember, 2001 maybe? Um, but there's still a lot of arsenic. It's not mobile. It does not reach the groundwater, luckily. It stays in the soil. So the highest concentration of arsenic is actually near the base of the wooden structure. That's what my research proved. Um, so how did we test for arsenic? It's a portable device called an XRF. It's based on X-ray. It's actually called X-ray fluorescence. It's basically point and shoot device. Um, and so we use it a lot to test the wood, test the soil, okay? Until, you know, we established there's really high arsenic level in that local playground in Bridgewater. What are our choices? Close it down. The town wouldn't want to do that. 
Um, and so we decided to seal the wooden structures, paint it. And we did, I organized two uh, paint the playground events in 2009 and students came to volunteer. Um, that's one thing that I realized, you know, if they know what the effect of what they're doing, it's saving the children from getting poisoned by arsenic when they play in the wooden structure. Um, it's easy to get volunteers. So I was so lucky to have so many volunteers. We finished play, painting the playground in those two days. And it's a huge playground. It's about 90,000 square feet. And so uh, I also got involved in uh, you know, making the physical science curriculum in middle school more interesting. And again, I need to fast forward because my time is running out. Um, so we basically designed, I, I redesigned some chemistry experiments to make it more interesting. And look at our, um, our list of, instead of chemicals from the shelf, these are the things that we use. Orange juice, Sprite, red cabbage, cornstarch, you know, things you can buy in the grocery store. And so the kids had fun testing it. Brockton Public School, eighth graders came to uh, campus and tested the experiment. It's a three and a half hour teaching module. Um, so they had a lot of fun. So the red cabbage is used as an indicator. It changes color depending on the acidity or basicity depending on pH. It's got a full spectrum of colors. And we did invisible ink. Uh, that was fun also. And the foaming toothpaste. So I'm also involved in undergraduate research. We do a lot of field work. That's you know how we test for lead in soil, arsenic in soil, lead in the water, arsenic in water. Um, uh, that's, that's a Photoshop picture just to show you that I'm so, um, I could face any danger in the water. It's Photoshop, of course. Surface water, you don't have alligators. And the good thing about it is my students get so involved. They learn to use the instruments that we have. Um, and it prepares them well for employment in graduate school. The most recent collaboration that I did, I did not go to Cambodia, but I sent a student there um, to help test for arsenic in water. As you know, uh, arsenic is a problem in uh, near the Bengal Delta, and Cambodia is one of those countries affected. They have a high concentration of arsenic in groundwater coming from naturally occurring uh, arsenic-containing rocks. And so we bought this arsenator. It's called arsenator, really, test kit. Uh, it changes color, so it's kind of like what you see here. Is the color chart. You put some, some packets, solid, in a sample of water, let it react for 20 minutes, and then there is a filter in there that changes color from white. And the intensity of the color depends on the level of arsenic. So that's my only involvement here. I did not go to Cambodia, but my student did all the testing for arsenic. Um, arsenic is bad because it's one of those cancer-causing chemicals. Never mind the ulcers, nerve damage, skin pigmentation. Those are actual pictures taken of people suffering from arsenic. Uh, what is it called? Arsenicosis. Arsenicosis. And uh, part of the BSU delegation to Preven, Cambodia. Uh, and with the people from the village. And this is the water treatment system. Again, my only part is bringing that arsenic, my student bringing that arsenate or test kit. Test kit. And uh, influent water, the arsenic, has over 600 parts per billion concentration. The um, safe level in the US is 10 parts per billion. 10. OK, you will not even find 10 in our drinking water here. It's below that. 625. That's very high. And so it's just a simple, uh, you know, the treatment system only includes to remove arsenic, some iron from nails. Uh, it binds to arsenic. And of course, the major problem with their water is really uh, bacteria. Bacteria. Yes. Uh, and also arsenic. So anyway, uh, sorry I had to rush, but I would be happy to entertain any questions from the audience.
Sure. How does that filtration system work exactly? Uh, there is called a bio sand filter. It's really out of cheap starting materials. There is a uh, there is sand layer, there is a clay layer. Clay absorbs a lot of impurities from water. Uh, sand, of course, makes the water infiltrate faster after it goes through the clay layer. Uh, even some metals get absorbed in the clay layer. Um, so it's, it's like a filter with sand, clay. Um, I don't know if there's another one with intermediate <laughs> particle size. And then I know one part of it has the iron nails that uh, absorb or react with arsenic to remove it from water. I, uh, I wish I put the design, it's not my design. So my, like I said, my involvement was to have that student test for arsenic, but I know they use iron nails to remove arsenic. There is also an, uh, an active bacteria, not harmful to humans, but they, they help um, interconvert probably arsenic from one form to another and some of the impurities from one form to another. I can't remember the details. This was two, three years ago. But yeah, it's simple materials. You can construct it at home. Any other questions? Looks like you're thinking of asking another one. Or thinking about the... What happens once the filtration system gets too full? Like, what is that going to expose the... Oh, yeah, that's always a problem with contaminants. Usually, most of the time, you just convert them from one form to another. So you remove it from water, and then it becomes part of the iron nails. Then what do you have to do? Is that what you're asking me? What do you have to do with the contaminated iron nails? At least you're able to concentrate the pollutant from this big you know, water um, source into a small volume of iron nails. But yeah, you gotta be careful. It does not go anywhere. It, you just convert it from one form to another. Same problems that are facing here with contaminants. Those Smokestacks have scrubbers that absorb pollutants like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. But they're converted from the gaseous state into the solid state. Then what do you do with the solid state pollutant? Some of them gets used for like plaster of Paris. Uh, sulfur dioxide, for example, it becomes calcium sulfate, which is in plaster. So it's got other applications. But inorganics like arsenic, you just contain it. Basically, you can convert into something else unless you want to do some nuclear reaction. Go ahead. Is the arsenic from the pressure tree the one we're actually transferring through the skin? Um, I think there is the possibility of dermal exposure, and that's why we encourage. We had big signs when we were painting the playground. We were talking to parents that have um, their kids wash their hands after playing in order to prevent thermal exposure. The most common uh, exposure route is by drinking contaminated water. But still, it can be prevented by washing their hands after playing. Any other questions that I can answer? I'm sorry, I didn't get to see the two of you because you were behind the column. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation. And thank you. If my story inspired even just two people from the audience, I'm very, very, very grateful. I'm very proud to be here today. Thank you. I want to uh, thank Dr. King. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I guess this is just a marketing thing. Uh, we are having another Asian Heritage event. Uh, this is coming Wednesday. Same time, same place, just this coming Wednesday. And it's um, about the emergence of China and the opportunity that America will have. And Dr. Uh, Lin Sun Chen from UMass Dartmouth will be here. Uh, he's 
a great researcher at UMass Dartmouth, if you guys don't know him. Uh, he's, he just finished, actually, the first Chinese encyclopedia. And um, he's doing a lot of research on Chinese banking. So if you're interested, please come by uh, this room uh, this coming Wednesday at 9.30. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.